Hi there, Kendra Tolbert here. I am a registered dietitian and yoga teacher specializing in PCOS and fertility. In this video, we're going to be talking about PCOS and carbohydrates. Now, I'm really excited about this. I'm literally having to like hold myself together <laughs> because this is one of my favorite topics to talk about with my clients. There's so many myths and misinformation um, and just kind of like restrictive, especially really restrictive thinking around carbohydrates when it comes to PCOS that I love sharing information that helps people be freer around their food choices and actually focus on the things that make a difference in their symptoms. Because if we're focused on the things that aren't true and don't really make a difference, then we miss out on the opportunity to actually support our health. So this video can be broken down into three parts. The first part, you and I are going to go over the basics. In the second part, we're going to go over the research. And in the third part, we're going to do some myth busting and we're going to answer some questions that I received here on YouTube. First up, the basics of carbohydrates. Our very first, can I say that right? Our very first question is, what are carbs? I think that's a good place to start. So one of the things that I see and I hear kind of from people when I'm having a conversation with them about nutrition is that carbs are a food group or a type of food. And that's not true. Carbs are actually a macronutrient, which is just a way of saying that they're a nutrient that our body needs in larger amounts compared to the nutrients that it needs in smaller amounts. So our macronutrients are protein, carbs, and uh, fat. So these are the things that actually give our bodies energy. You might have heard that carbohydrates are our body's preferred source of energy, and that's absolutely true. Second question, where do we find carbohydrates? Like which foods are they in? They're in dairy, they're in our plant-based foods, right? So they're in um, beans, peas, lentils, grains, fruits, vegetables, they're in a lot of things, and in a lot of things that we know support our health, and they're in a wide variety of foods. Third question, how does our body break down and make use of carbohydrates? We're going to get a little nerdy here, <laughs> hopefully not too nerdy. We'll just go over the basics of digestion for carbohydrates. So it all starts in our mouth. While you and I are chewing our foods, our teeth, you know, it's breaking it down, our tongue is moving it around and it's being exposed to saliva. Within that saliva is an enzyme called amylase, and that amylase starts to break down those carbohydrate chains into smaller pieces. From there, it goes down our esophagus and into our stomach. Once it's in our stomach, the stomach acid actually starts to deactivate or inactivate that enzyme amylase. So it's no longer the amylase that's breaking it down, and from there, it's the churning and turning of our stomach and all of that food kind of swishing around that further breaks it down. From there, the food, whatever it might be, goes down into our small intestine. And there, the carbohydrates are once again exposed to an enzyme. This time, it's pancreatic amylase. So it's amylase that comes from our pancreas, and it continues to break it down into smaller pieces. From there, the carbohydrates that our body can break down and use for energy gets absorbed, gets sent to the liver, where the liver saves some of it, packages it for later use, and sends some of it into our bloodstream where our cells will have access to it to use for energy. This is where insulin comes in. So the insulin lets the cells know that there is sugar out in the blood that it can then use for energy. Now you remember I said the carbohydrates that our body can break down and use for energy. There are some types of carbohydrates that our body actually just kind of moves along down into our large intestine where they provide the food or fuel for probiotics, the healthy gut bacteria that we know supports our health. This is also where fiber is. So fiber helps to move our stool along so that you and I can properly let go of the waste that we no longer need. Now I said something that might have you thinking, ah, but this is why carbohydrates are bad for PCOS. I said sugar, because the carbohydrates get broken down into smaller molecules, sugar molecules. Um, and I said insulin. And in a lot of cases, the information that I've come across is presented as if sugar and insulin are inherently bad when it comes to PCOS. 
Fortunately, that's not true, right? Our body, no matter what condition you have, your body still needs energy. It still needs insulin to do what insulin needs to do. Now, of course, we don't want these things too high, but that doesn't mean that we don't want them at all. <laughs> we need them to a degree. And it's all about balance rather than going to an extreme. I said this to a client once, and I hope it resonates with you. You don't have to go to an extreme to find balance. There's this idea that you need to go as far away from certain foods. You need to be as restrictive as possible to get to a place of balance. But extreme are the exact opposite of balance. Balance is that kind of like middle way. It's the gray area. So if you're going to an extreme in an attempt to find balance, you might be going in the wrong direction. Now, back to carbs. <laughs> so next section, you and I are now going to explore some of the research. And this is where I will be talking about numbers. So if you don't want to hear specific numbers, you know, you can move on to the next section. And I also want to say that the numbers that I'm going to be sharing, I'm not sharing so that you can go and start to count your carbs or count your calories. I'm strictly letting you know what the researchers were looking at so that you have context and understanding for what the research actually says versus kind of how it gets twisted in the social media blog sphere world, because it's very different than what the actual research says. So the first study that you and I are going to take a look at was a eucaloric nutrition study. Now eucaloric just means that the calories that the researchers gave the study participants to eat for that day was the same amount as the researchers assumed or estimated, really not sure how they came up with that number, um, that the person was going to expend that day. So they weren't eating less than what they expended, they weren't eating more than what they expended. They found this kind of equilibrium. So. 30 participants in a crossover study. So for eight weeks, they ate one way, eight weeks, they ate another way, measured at the end of those eight weeks, um, eight weeks each, and decided, you know, which diet seemed to be the most beneficial. So there was the 40% calories from carbohydrates diet and the 55% of calories coming from carbohydrates diet. So we'll call it the 40% carbohydrate diet and we'll call it the 55% carbohydrate diet. So the 40% carbohydrate diet, while people were on it or after they were off of it um, and they were measured, they found that, you know, this seemed to be more beneficial. So people were like, yeah, low carb diet. <laughs> Good for PCOS. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because if you lower carbohydrates, you have to increase something else. So they increased protein. They increased fat. They also increased uh, fiber. They also increased the variety and diversity of the foods that were provided on the diet. They increased unsaturated fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory. Like, how do we know it was a lowering of carbohydrates as much as it was the increase of all these other things? <sighs> thing that really gets me <laughs> is that the researchers actually say this was a tightly controlled study. What did they control for? I get that they, you know, they had to change the, the macronutrient composition. They had to. That's the only way to get the same number of calories while having less carbs. So something has to go up. But they didn't control for fiber. If they had found a way to keep the variety the same across both diets, keep the fiber the same across both diets, to keep the unsaturated fatty acids the same across both diets, then maybe we could say it was the carbohydrates, but too many other things changed to make it all about the carbohydrates, right? Maybe it was something else. And that's actually really good news because that lets me know that maybe we can focus in on, and this is how I work with my clients, maybe we can focus in on how can we add in more variety? How can we enjoy protein along with our carbohydrates? How can we have more fiber? How can we have more micronutrients? How can we have more unsaturated fatty acids? There's this idea that there's an expansion. There's more to enjoy. Rather than when we make it all about carbs, it becomes about how little we get to have. One feels really good. <laughs> One feels really freeing. And the other feels restrictive and constrictive. And I'm all about freedom. So that's the one that I'm choosing. And that's the one that I recommend that you explore. Just something to consider. 
The second study that you and I will take a look at was actually an ad libitum diet. So ad libitum just means that there was no calorie restriction, there was no calorie goal, people just ate ad libitum <laughs> as, they, as they chose freely, as they will. Um, but what they did change was the percentage of calories that came from, or energy, that came from protein versus carbohydrates. So they had a standard protein diet that was lower in protein and higher in carbohydrates, and they had a high protein diet that was lower in carbohydrates and higher in protein. In this study, they found that those who consumed more protein had better outcomes. They had improvements in their symptoms, they had improvements in their labs, which would make people think, oh, okay, people with PCOS might benefit from protein, which I actually wholeheartedly agree with. I think, though, a lot of people still get focused on the fact that it was lower in carbs. I don't think that needs to be the attention uh, or the place where we focus our attention. If we know that adding more protein is beneficial, start there. Rather than starting with, let me see how many carbs I can get down to, focus on how many, you know, can I add some protein to this meal in a way that feels good and balanced and nourishing to me? Just another thing to consider. We have made it to section three of this video, which is where we get to bust some myths and answer some questions. I'm excited. I really don't like misinformation. I don't. So let's bring on the truth. <laughs> so myth number one is that people with PCOS can't have sugar. Like not at all. No, oh, no. Not true. People with PCOS might, uh, if they have insulin resistance, might be impacted by sugar a bit differently than people who don't have insulin resistance. So in that case, perhaps a place that we can go rather than saying eliminate them is what can I pair these with? What amount feels good to my body? Only you know that. You'll have to do some experimentation. You'll have to do some trial and error, but you don't need to feel like you cannot have anything sweet at all, because that's just not true. Second myth is that people with PCOS can't have much fruit. This kind of stems from that idea that sugar is bad for people with PCOS and fruit contains sugar, so fruit must be bad, right? No, wrong. <laughs> we already talked about the fact that you can have sugar if you have PCOS. Um, beyond that, fruit isn't just sugar. Can we not narrow things down or reduce things down to just one characteristic of it? Fruit also contains fiber. It also contains vitamins and minerals and anti-inflammatory properties. Like it, it contains other things than sugar. And those other things are super beneficial for our health. So you can absolutely have fruit. If you have PCOS, you might just want to play with what it feels like to pair it with something that has protein and fat and notice how you feel compared to when you don't. And then you get to decide what works best for your body. Third myth which I feel like we pretty much busted uh, when we took a look at those two studies. And the myth that we're going to bust right now <laughs> is that people with PCOS need to be on a very low carbohydrate diet. Simply not true. If you think back to that research study, it was about 180 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's not super low, and it's definitely not as low as a lot of the I'm going to just name them. Atkins, paleo, or keto diets recommend. You don't need to go super low. There's no benefit in going super low. I think there's this idea that the more restrictive you are, the harder and harsher you are, the better it is. And that's just not true. So unnecessary and untrue. Now that the myths are out of the way, let's go ahead and answer those two questions that I received. So the first question I received was about carb tolerance. Now, to be completely honest, carb tolerance wasn't even something I was aware of until this question was asked. So thank you for asking it. What I came across pretty much pointed to that this is more so an idea that comes from the world of paleo and the world of Atkins diets, and those aren't my world. Um, I do have a colleague who talks about it with her clients a bit, and she looks at it not so much from a like, how many carbs can I eat and still lose weight, which seems to be, and I could be wrong, you know, but this is what I know so far, um, to be kind of how it's measured over in that world. And she looks at it more as how does my body feel throughout the day when I have carbohydrates at this point or this point or this point and in this amount or this amount or this amount. So it's really tuning into how you feel and noticing 
Um, do I feel better when I have more carbohydrates in the morning versus at night? Or when I pair it with this versus that? And so you're noticing what feels good to you. I'm a huge fan of that, but you know, I don't think we have to label it. Uh, to me, that's just mindful eating. That's paying attention to your body. And I, I'm a big fan of that. That's all I've got. <laughs> so our second question was about what to do about carb cravings. I actually did a yoga video around carb cravings that you can watch. I'll link to it below. Um, I say get curious. That's what to do about them. Uh, I'm not a fan of trying to crush them or stop them or beat them or overcome them. I say get curious. What are they telling you? They might be telling you that you didn't get enough sleep the night before. They might be telling you that you're not eating enough carbs. And so now you want them. That would make sense. They might be telling you that your blood sugar is out of balance and it's time to have a conversation with your doctor about insulin resistance. They could be telling you any number of things. So my recommendation is always to get curious. Julie Duffy Dillon actually allowed me to share, she's so sweet, um, allowed me to share a carb craving flow sheet in the previous video. Again, I'll link to that below. And you can go through that flow sheet and know which questions to ask yourself to notice what cues and clues are these carb cravings giving me? I think that's the best place to start. Be curious. That's what to do about them. Be curious. Okay, friends. So that was a lot. <laughs> I want to know, let me know in the comments below what questions you have, what your big takeaways were. I love talking about this stuff. So let me know so we can have this conversation down below. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Know that I'm always wishing you all the best. Be well and bye for now.